Okay, great. Well, um, I, I'd be happy to get started here. I know we're a small group, but we're a mighty group um, <laughs> as far as uh, being able to put together some, um, our presentation. We'll also record it, so not only to benefit others who didn't make it, but for you to go back and go through it, to listen to it if there's some things that you want to refresh your mind on. So we're talking about fiber to the library, uh, and today we're primarily focused on, as an overview, of what um, needs to be done by perhaps it will be you, perhaps it'll be um, us helping you uh, to get to have the fiber um, at your library and it would be next July, hopefully, that would be our target of 2023. So we're focused primarily on special construction today and we have a few people to introduce to you um, that you may not have met yet. Um, I think probably our staff you know but we'll start with Sam and go down the line and introduce. I'm Sam Shaw. I'm the, the Planning and Data Services and LST Coordinator here at the Commission. Of course I'm Holly Wolt and I guess primarily I'm a technology specialist in regard to uh, broadband fiber and network equipment um, at uh, the public libraries in Nebraska. And then I'm Becca Kingery. Uh, if most of you remember hearing from Tom Rolfes in the past, I started working with him about a year ago and recently he moved on to the NTIA, which I think you're gonna hear a little bit about today. And upon his departure, I took his position. So I'm here from the FCIO for Network Nebraska. And for Krista. <laughs> Hi, yep. I'm uh, Krista Porter. I am the Library Development Director at the Nebraska Library Commission. And um, one of my duties is that, that is my main part of uh, this special construction, is I am the state E-rate coordinator for public libraries in the state. So I do training and, um, and um, assistance in helping with um, all of our public libraries do their E-rate. And I think it would be great, uh, we're a small group. Um, I see that we have our guest uh, library um, a person here who uh, is from Kimball, Amber. And uh, if you want to introduce yourself because you're actually part of the presentation first, and then if we could follow through with the other um, folks on the line and just uh, give us your name, and then I have something special to ask you to contribute to, very simple. So we'll get Amber going first. Uh, my name is Amber Sweetland. I'm the director for the Kimball Public Library. And Amber is here because, again, last uh, year she uh, uh, applied on behalf of the Kimball Public Library for special construction and received it. And she's going to share a little bit about her experiences, probably the good, the bad, and hopefully no ugly. <laughs> so, so can we move on to... Um, I can't see everyone else. Is anybody else on that would like to introduce themselves? I can't see it. Um, let's see here. Yeah, hang on a sec here. I am going to All right, um, Sarah, Stephanie, and Terry, you're the three people we have. I've unmuted all of you. If you have a microphone, you can um, introduce yourself and think about answering these questions that we have up here on the screen. Or if you don't have a microphone, you can type into the question section, same information. Ah, okay, so Sarah's typed in. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, Sarah Sanderson, she's director at the Sioux County Public Library in Harrison. Welcome. Good morning, y'all. This is Stephanie Malcolm, and I am the director at the Palisade Public Library in Palisade, Nebraska, uh, very southwest corner of Nebraska. Mm. Um, I, I don't really have complaints about our internet. Um, I, I really want to engage our patrons more with the internet and I'm, I'm planning some programming for that. Um, we do have very slow internet access for a lot of people in our community. So offering faster internet would be a boon for all of us. Great, welcome. And Terry, if you have a microphone, you can speak or you can type into the questions section in your GoToWebinar interface, whichever. Hmm. 
not seeing anything, but I know from our registrations, Terry Feynman is the uh, from Stratton Public Library. Right, and I visited with Terry. I'm excited to have you on board, Terry, and that you were able to come and be on live uh, with us uh, today. Um, she just expressed um, what many of the rural public libraries in Nebraska say, well, we're just so small, I just don't know if we, if we need to have fiber. And uh, you'll see that's uh, mm -hmm. uh, something that's uh, pretty commonly stated by rural libraries in Nebraska. But we're mm -hmm. happy to see you and hopefully we can change your mind and, and get you on your way to fiber to your community, in fact, mm -hmm. also. And she did actually type in, she typed something long. I can't see when people are typing, so I have to wait till it pops up. <laughs> but oh, she says, great. Terry Feynman, you can find me in Stratton, Nebraska. We have very weak computers at this time and only one working. Um, got new ones coming. So they are getting new equipment too. Good, great. Well, this is your well. voice to, to, to do big things, Terry. <laughs> Thank you. Should we just go on then? Yeah, I think we'll just keep moving through. <clears throat> so, um, I have to tell you, I'm at a disadvantage here. I cannot read the the screen that's in front of me because our lights are pretty bright so that you can see us. I'm not sure that that matters as much, but um, one of the things, these are the things we're going to address, and right off the bat, I decided to put this information in as is why, why this is the perfect time for you to connect fiber to Nebraska Public Libraries, and this would be about you. Um, there's tons of money, and we'll be talking about it shortly, that's coming into the state through the federal government, and it is offering opportunities for primarily rural or very low speed um, libraries with internet speeds uh, to uh, come to switch to fiber, uh, to, um, to do uh, infrastructure uh, projects, et cetera. And I, I think that this is a really important uh, piece for Nebraska to catch on to. Sam is going to do a bit of a data review. Um, and this is what I was alluding to, too. I think a lot of times Nebraska public libraries, rural libraries, feel like they might be isolated and they're the only one. And they might be thinking, oh, I really should have a faster speed. But there's a lot of things that make it difficult or barriers for your library to be able to move to fiber or even a faster speed. And so um, he will be able to give us some information telling us about where we are standing as far as uh, in where your library may be standing as far as uh, um, its data in, and its speed for um, internet in Nebraska. And then we're going to be talking about options um, for your fiber build outs. And that's where I'm working with our new uh, team member, Becca. And I also want to make sure you all know that this is uh, this cross agency uh, working together is kind of a, a little bit unusual. And uh, we can thank the OCIO for kind of uh, giving us an invitation to join them for a few grants a few years ago. And this is where this relationship started. So we welcome Becca and uh, we've had a good time um, visiting already and, and uh, about projects and things that we want to do into the future. And we, of course, have our live from uh, Kimball Public Library, Amber, coming to talk to us and be thinking about questions that you might have to ask her related to some of your concerns if you're thinking about fiber to the library or what about special construction. She'll give you a summary, but we hope that she's engaged in our question and answers afterwards. And at the very end, we have resources for you that are available now as uh, once you complete uh, viewing and being a part of the webinar that you can go to to find out additional information to answer questions. And then we have a Q&A time. Thank you. Okay, so we're going to talk about Wi Fiber now before we get into the nuts and bolts of special construction because uh, there's some developments that have happened this past year um, related to funding and that I alluded to in the beginning that have come into uh, from the federal government to states, and in particular, um, we'll move forward. We're going uh, one slide forward. Okay, so in particular, we're going to be talking about uh, the 
funds that are coming through the NTIA, which is the uh, National Technology and Information Administration, and it's under the uh, uh, Department of Commerce that, that established by, and I'm reading this here, by a bill that was passed last November, which is the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, and it's also known as the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law, Bipartisan Information Law uh, passed. Okay, I'm doing a, a double there, but Bipartisan in, um, Infrastructure Law that was passed last year. And if you look here, you'll see um, that this is a substantial amount of money, and we're going to be focusing primarily today and just our little bit of discussion of why now on the first two columns of this uh, presentation um, slide. Um, and, and in particular, we are going to be talking about the, let's move forward. Move forward with the slide. Okay. The, the side over on the, the slide um, pocket that's over on the right that talks about the six uh, funding groups and in particular, you see the one that's highlighted and it's basically includes libraries. So in this funding, there is this huge chunk of funding. There is money there for the libraries. There's also a kind of an interesting piece about this. The focus is on is some particular individual who lives. So this is residential business and libraries, other anchor institutions, um, or lives in is falling. Uh, in the following uh, households, it would be an individual with disabilities, individuals 60 years of age or older, individuals with language barriers or a low level of literacy, individuals who are members of a racial or ethnic minority group, individuals who reside in a rural area, veterans, individuals who are incarcerated or in transition from incarceration, so this, I think that it's not necessarily says it covers everybody, but I think that we can call this um, uh, internet for everybody or access to internet for everybody. Um, let's see what else. Um, so if we move forward in the next slide, this is the, the two slides that I talked about. One was the Digital Equity Act and the other one was for the bead, the columns. And you can see here highlighted how much funding is coming into Nebraska from this $2.75 um, uh, billion. And it's amazing to know that the, in Nebraska, that five, 598, almost $600,000 is just going for a planning grant, which is um, unprecedented in the federal government. This is the first time this is happening. And right now we're kind of working on, um, well, I should say the Library Commission is also engaged in this and is a part of the planning grant uh, group. Uh, we've been asked to be on board with that. And so we're doing a lot of listening right now to, and, and going out and having meetings in communities to find out what it is uh, that we can do um, with the funds for the Digital Equity Act to meet the needs of the community. And uh, so let's see, what else do we have to say? So you, um, and that planning grant runs October 1 through September 30th. It's, a, it's kind of a sliding type of a thing. A it's about a year. Right. Yeah, the planning, that's the other thing. Thanks, Sam. The planning is for a full year of time. And, the, and then the actual uh, state uh, grant, sorry. One of the things I like about this is that there is um, the potential for um, the division of the funding that we could have, uh, the Library Commission could have its own sub-grant and work with libraries to um, in, enhance uh, digital equity in their communities uh, by just administering a grant that's out of this digital equity grant. There's just tons of money in there. Okay, let's move forward. And I guess I didn't mention the timeline is the same also for both grants. It's a four year, approximately a four year grant. This is where um, I wanted just to highlight when uh, there was a discussion about um, bringing 
faster speed to your community and through the library, you don't realize that there's really a great potential for this. And this is why I'm saying this right now is to help you to understand when you're visiting with your communities that the BEAD program is offering um, the connection to uh, first off has three priorities. First off is it, uh, um, any residential or uh, area or a business that has uh, underserved, which would be 25 megabyte, megabits per second uh, speed um, to, the, <clears throat> to the residents. And then the second priority is from 25 to 120 for businesses and residential. Unfortunately, the third group includes libraries. And they're saying that they're, the funding probably won't make it to the third group. But this is a silver lining. If the library uses special construction funding, which we'll hear about, to bring the anchor of the, um, the fiber into the community, then the providers will solicit to uh, the, the Public Service Commission and ask them, or, or they'll solicit for proposal for being awarded a certain area. And so that can be a community that has a library as its anchor, and then all the, the uh, broadband the, goes out to the uh, through fiber to the residents and to the like the downtown businesses or any any businesses in the area. So when we're looking at this as an option, um, I think that this would be play well in rural areas because one of the things is which you'll learn from special construction or if you read my email, it is really um, a great discount that can be used in order to bring that fiber to the library. And so business uh, ISPs are very interested in doing that because then they have a location in with fiber node in the in the community and then they can disperse out using this bead fund uh, to do that um, the moving forward with that the bead program is based off of a map by the FCC of the locations that they decide as, as areas to divide Nebraska and all states up into in order to be able to um, uh, offer ISPs the uh, ability to provide a proposal. So it's kind of like one ISP, like your local one might say, I can do this for this much money. And then another one will come in and say, oh, well, I can do it for this much money. And so once one is awarded, then they, they can move forward and provide not only that the library has that high speed, but through the rest of the residents. And so to me, this is a key point, and this is really what I was driving for uh, through the, this part of the presentation and doing it early is that, that as a library, you need to be talking in your community to your administrators and your movers and shakers about the possibility of coordinating this kind of an activity. Um, mm -hmm. So it's not just for the library. Yeah, that means some healthy competition that this will, uh instigate <laughs> yes and, and you may be surprised um who um actually has uh sometimes you have some uh provider that you weren't really aware of and is not your provider but they come in with a, a great uh, a great bid for doing the, the services for fiber and okay. i think something that i uh, to note too on both this the the bead timeline and the digital equity one, equity one previous slide um that Holly mentioned, the planning is happening now and, and through 2023. None of this will actually be implemented until 2024. What we're talking about today with special construction, this would be done in 2023. So you would be ahead of the game of these um, things that are still to come. And I think that's, oh, that's also true because I don't believe the map that they can work with even for the, you know, like you're saying in the, the bead grant, I don't think that that map is going to be um, available. Do you know, do you have any idea? No. And I thought it may be a, a year before that's done too. They, I mean, they've talked about the maps in stages. So I think they have, plan to have their first edition later this year. But as far as I understand the NTA is, the NTIA is not going to move forward until they have the second configuration, which is slated for 2023. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, so we'll move forward. So we're just going to put this up here for posterity. I don't really have much to talk about except for this new website that the state of Nebraska has um, um, developed and is live now. This is a place you can go to read about announcements related to uh, Nebraska specific or, and I suspect some federal types of things that are down the pipeline. But this is where you're going to find out more about what fiber is um, uh, where fiber is being placed in Nebraska and what kind of state uh, funding there is for um, uh, developing programs for bringing fiber to communities. I think that's probably it. So this is talking about getting involved. And, and again, this is the reason why I started with this slide because uh, these set of slides I, because I wanted to keep it in your mind as you go through and we talk in depth about special construction and Chris is right it's special construction has been around but also we want to be sure that we now see that we have some other um, avenues of of um, funding available that they can complement each other and your community not only your library community library but your community has an opportunity here to grow too um, I think that's probably it for what I need to be talking about. And this uh, came, uh, the slides came from uh, NTIA uh, via Tom Rolfus, and I wanted to give him credit for that because he spent some time talking to me about this. Yeah, so, his uh, position there, yeah. Yeah, and I think that, you know, now now we'll be focused on, for the, the remainder, special construction um, and E-rate, et cetera, and other topics. But if you want to visit with me um, later about this, topic, um, or if you want to talk to Tom, then please feel free to, um, you know, we can, I can put you in contact with him if you have questions. Thank you. Move on. Okay. Um, one of the things I was looking at when I put these slides together, if you want to go to the next one, Krista, um, I just want to talk a little bit about where we're at um, with data sources and like what you can do if you're planning your project. But I think one of the overarching themes here is to look at the needs of your community. Um, before you look at, you know, some of these resources that we're gonna show um, about data sources, you know, look at part of the larger planning landscape. Um, that may have to do with your infrastructure in your library, your internet speed, but also your equipment that you're using. You know, is that up to date? Um, you know, what are the needs of your community? Um, and that's, you know, your internet speed, your equipment, the availability, um, you know, is your Wi-Fi connected to outdoor spaces? You know, like, is your town square next to your library? And are there events um, that could take advantage of Wi-Fi in that area, you know, at certain times when the library may not be open, um, for instance? So I think that's kind of the overarching thing. And then how does that affect library programs, services? Um, are there programs and services that you're not able to offer now that you could with, um, with upgrading your infrastructure? Um, are there other needs in the community that you have, like uh, say your meeting room, for instance? Um, do people in the community use other meeting room resources because the library can't handle you know, those um, technology needs of the community? So I think those are the, some of the things that you can look at, you know, kind of as the overarching planning process. Um, but there are a few data sources available here to help you with that. Um, of course, many of you know, we have public library survey. We collect that data, those data, uh, mid-November through mid-February every year. So the most current is fiscal year 2021. We also have a web page um, uh, that summarizes that as it, pertains specifically to internet and broadband, and that's the second link there. And then we have a third link that um, is within that um, second link page that um, uh, is a county fact sheet that's tailored towards towards um, specific counties. And I don't know if you can click on that third link, Krista, I wanna show, maybe if we could show that. Um, um, Cause that's kind of helpful. Um, can you click on that third link, is that openable? No, but um, I can bring it up. Just give me two seconds here. I can get it up separately. Because um, I think that's a good, I want to show that because I think that's a good starting point for libraries and looking at where you're at. 
Um, and it, it has some talking points in there that I think are, are helpful to people that maybe are thinking about uh, what you're <clears throat> going to talk about later with Category 2 and special construction. That's broadband. All right. There it is. Okay, hold on a sec. I am going I, to... I apologize. I didn't tell you about that ahead of time. I kind of threw you for a loop okay. there. <laughs> there we go. Okay, so that's the, the third link on that slide. We'll take you to this page, and it's a county by county. Um, you have links by county. And so if you could click on the second one, um, Crystal, which is Antelope County. And the reason um, we're not going with Adams County is because there's only one library in Adams County. It's Hastings public library and so this is a little bit better um, better example um, so what you'll see is on the left hand side I don't know if you can read that or not um, but you'll what you'll see on the left hand side is kind of a summary of some FCC data it shows uh, the percentage of population with broadband available for the entire state and then rural areas you'll see you know that's quite quite a bit lower than the entire state and then how Antelope County in particular compares to that um, down at the bottom there. And then on the right hand side, you'll see the percentage of the population with broadband subscription uh, for the entire state as a whole, and then and then Antelope County as it as it uh, compares. And then if you scroll down a little bit, you'll see a summary, and this um, kind of in the middle there, this summarizes uh, the libraries that are in Antelope County. So we have Clearwater, Elgin, Neely, uh, Lois Johnson Memorial in Oakdale, and then Orchard Public Library. And so this summarizes the PLS data, shows the legal service area of those libraries, the what they reported on the last public library survey for their maximum download speed. And then we on the third column we have a persons per megabit index. What we do, what we've done there is to look at the top end of the speed and then the legal service area, and that gives you a persons per megabit index. So it's actually the LSA divided by the speed. Let me make sure I got that right. Yeah, the LSA is on top, speed's on the bottom. And so the lower the number, the better um, that uh, speed meets the needs of that community. And so you'll notice here that, um, for instance, Clearwater, you know, has a population of 398, and their top end speed is 50 megabits per second. So they have a relatively low number, it's eight, uh, as compared to, say, Lois Johnson, which has you know, a slightly less population, but only a three megabit um, top end speed. So their uh, index is 96. So it's quite a bit higher than what Clearwater is. And then if you scroll down a little bit, there's some talking points there that should help you about, you know, some other resources. Um, you know, this is a sheet that you that's, that's up to date. You can print it out. It's a good talking point to take to your um, to your library board or community. Um, uh, to kind of give you a starting point as to where you're at and then some other resources that would help you in the planning process. I'm, I'm wondering if the libraries um, have a, like smaller, not necessarily a regional meeting, but if any of the these libraries uh, today that are on or in the, in the recording, if they have a group of um, that gets together, this would be a, an interesting um, piece of uh, information to share with them too, you know, as they mm -hmm. look across and they're able to reference this and, and have a conversation. So there are meetings in some areas of the state and then some of our regional library system directors host get togethers of library directors in their areas. So it might be something to mention to them that you might want to have a, a meeting specifically. Um, this might be the topic of. And the other thing that's not in this handout that you can definitely get from the public library survey data is your ISP. Um, so that may be important if some of these communities are close and one of them has, you know, fantastic speed in one ISP and the other one doesn't. Um, that may be something to look at, too. Right. I think that that's true, too. So if you want to go back to the uh, to the slides there, Krista, thank you. And the next one. So I've kind of summarized some of our PLS data just to show where we're at. Um, and this is the most current, which is fiscal year 2021. You'll notice a relatively large number in the 
24 to 50 and the 50 to 100, but, you know, we've got this cluster that's, you know, less than 24, you know, where we've got 10, almost 10 libraries that are less than 1.5, and then these other clusters, and those are the libraries that we'd like to see move, you know, up in that 24 to 50, 50 to 100, and then 100 plus range. Um, so that kind of summarizes those speed ranges, and these are self-reported on the survey too, mm -hmm. um, so they may fluctuate from time to time too. And we've noticed that some libraries have actually upgraded their speed since the last survey. So yeah. we imagine that this would probably change when the next survey launches in November. Um, so it'd be interesting to see how, how the landscape changes. So if you want to go to the next slide. So and then we have a summary of connection types. Um, you see that we have quite a few that are on fiber optic, but almost the same number of D that, that are on DSL. And so what we'd like to see is those uh, DSL cable and area wireless um, libraries move to the fiber optic category. And next slide. So this is kind of, as I put this together, this was, uh, we updated this from a presentation we did, what, three years ago? Mm -hmm. And this was one of the slides that was in there and I hesitated to put this in there again because this, <laughs> this is sort of misleading. I mean, if you look at this and you think, oh, uh, you know, this is what we talked about earlier with the lower speed ratio being good and the higher speed ratio maybe being not so good. It looks like Three Rivers is way behind, but if you look at the number of libraries in Three Rivers library system compared to Central Plains, uh, it's about 20 more, 20 to 25, I think, more in Three Rivers than Central Plains. So you have more libraries. Uh, and then Western uh, has the lowest number of libraries, I think about 40. And then you have to also look at uh, which libraries completed a survey because we're using public library survey data and there may be libraries that didn't submit a survey. So that factors in here too. But if you look at it, uh, statewide numbers, you know, uh, are comparable to Western library system and Southeast, um, Three Rivers, a little bit higher. We'd like to see that a little lower and Central Plains looks like it's, um, you know, a little bit better than the statewide average. So if you want to go to the next slide, Krista. So this was interesting as I updated this slide. Um, this uh, shows the uh, three year, the last prior three years of internet speeds in Nebraska libraries, and we've kind of divided this in three categories of unser under unserved, which is less than 12 megabits per second, and then underserved, which is 12 to 24, and then served, which is 24 plus. And uh, you'll notice that that underserved line hasn't moved at all over the last three years. It's pretty much stagnant. But from 20, 2020 to 2021, you've almost seen a flip-flop in the unserved and the served, as the served mm -hmm. has went way up and the, and the unserved has went down. Mm -hmm. um, so, so, I, so that's good news. And, uh, but we'd like to see you know, that cluster of about 30 libraries that are unserved and 30 libraries that are underserved kind of go up to that served category. It's kind of like a flat line. <laughs> yeah. So, so we'd like to see those numbers go up to that served category, but it's good that there's a, you know, almost uh, from 2020 to 2021, the served has almost tripled. Um, mm -hmm. you know, it's kind of it's good that the unserved and underserved did not go up though. <laughs> Things that's, are at least in the, that's a very in the good, right direction. <laughs> that's a very good point. Yeah. I think this is actually also, I, I see, what I see here is, an, and it's a side effect of the COVID-19 pandemic, I believe. Uh, when that happened, everyone realized everything went remote, school, work, and uh, communities and, and, you know, all that funding we were talking about coming, all of that is like a side effect of everyone realizing everybody needs good internet. It should be a right that everyone has everywhere, and some companies are already on board with it and doing it um, before even this money that's coming now in the next um, few years. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of like what I was trying to get at in the planning part at the beginning. Like, you know, do you have a community room? Is it, you know, is that meet the needs of Zoom meetings that, you know, those, those needs that people have now with people coming in remotely? Mm -hmm. um, you know, it may not be. There may be other areas in the community that those people are turning to that they could be turning to the library. Mm -hmm. You know, if they had a more stable and um, not not just a more faster speed, but more stable too. Yeah, with, with the fiber network, with reliability and, like and speed. Yeah, both yeah. of those are the issues. What with why you look to fiber instead of um, I don't know. I personally I live out in the country, so I don't have a 
DSL possibility, but you know, I, I hear there's a lot of fluctuation um, with that type of service and non-reliability. And so even if, um, if the, somebody is watching this and they say, well, you know, we can serve our community with the, uh, 50 megabits and, and we've got, we're, we're okay at 100 even, I still say this is the time flush with money for you, an opportunity for you to move to a reliable, scalable um, uh, internet speed. Jump on that while, while it's available right now and think to the future. Go bigger than what you think. Oh, we just need, like you said, 50 or 100. Go for five gig, go for more than that. Think about what's gonna be happening in, in the future, yeah. Right. Absolutely, yeah. Is that it, Sam? That's it, yeah. Okay. I think that was my last slide too. It was, yes. <laughs> Do you want me to just pick up from here then? Sure, um, I, I think that what today, um, don't worry, and, and I guess I'd like to, if it's okay with you, Krista, to tell everybody to kind of sit back and relax. And, and just kind of watch this if they're not familiar with E-Rate or, you know, just finding out about special construction. Because we will have a workshop, um, Krista and I will be doing one on Octo October, I believe the 13th in, in the afternoon. Um, and it's on the calendar, but there's no information associated with it. It's on the NLC's calendar. Mm -hmm. And um, we'll make sure that we include that in our um, email that when we send our recording. But this is just, time to sit and then either pat yourself on your back and say, oh, I knew that, or say, oh, well, that's interesting. But one thing I wanna be sure you understand is that we are here to help you through all this. So if you look at all this and say, oh my gosh, I can't do it. We don't expect you to do it alone. And um, Kristen has done a marvelous job the last couple of years working with special construction. You know, because of COVID too, she remotes into your uh, into your computer and mm -hmm. uh, helps with the submission of the forms, et cetera, that she'll be talking about. So um, again, sit back, relax, and enjoy a segment. <laughs> Great, especially enjoy E-rate. Sure. <laughs> I wish people could. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Um, yeah. <laughs> All right. Thanks, Holly. Um, yeah. And Holly's been, of, of course, help, very helpful with this special construction we've been doing as well. Um, you'll hear about doing, not in detail today, but like she said in the later workshop, um, doing an RFP, request for proposal, request for quotes, which can be horribly intimidating. Don't worry about that either. We have templates, we have help help guides. Um, we will hold your hands through the whole process. We've done it with many libraries um, in the last three years, so uh, last two years. So um, we will get you through this. Uh, so as I said, I'm going to take just 10 minutes ish here to talk about E-Rate and the special construction program that we have. Uh, Fuller training coming, as Holly said, in addition to our specific special construction training, I will have my usual fall workshops that are just E-Rate in general. Uh, those are to be scheduled sometime in um, November, so look forward to those. Um, I did do in August an E-Rate 101 session on Encompass Live on August 17th, so there's a recording of that, a one-hour um, intro to E-Rate. So if you wanted to get a little more than today, but a little less than a full three hour workshop, you can go and watch that recording. Yeah. <laughs> so um, E-Rate, what is E-Rate? E-Rate is an FCC program and to ensure, I'm just gonna read what it says, that schools and libraries can obtain high speed internet access and telecommunications at affordable rates uh, to keep students and library patrons connected to broadband by providing a discount on eligible services. It's not a grant program or a loan program, it's just a discount on what you pay. It um, is done through the Federal Communications Commission, the FCC. Uh, the funding to give these discounts to schools and libraries comes from the universal service fee. This is a one of those many fees and taxes that you and I and all the service providers pay on your bills whenever you pay for your telephone and internet services each month. And it is run by uh, USAC, which is a not-for-profit company that was set up by the FCC back in 1996. 67 when this first was um, started E-Rate um, Universal Service Administrative Company um, so you hear me talk about USAC they handle all the um, you know, working with you on doing your E-Rate. E-Rate funding is given out on um, based on funding years 
Um, each funding year runs from July 1st of one year to June 30th of the next year. So right now, when you are applying for E-rate here in the fall of 2022, you are thinking about receiving your discount starting July 2023. Holly had mentioned that earlier too, that that's what we're talking about. That's when your fiber may be set up as well. So right now you're thinking of applying for funding year 2023, which runs July 1st, 2023 through June 30th, 2024. So you're always thinking forward for E-rate. Um, who's eligible to apply? All libraries in Nebraska, all public libraries in Nebraska are eligible. Um, the USAC's FCC rules are they must be eligible for LSTA funding. This is Library Service and Technology Act funding um, to the um, Institute of Museum and Library Services, and all public libraries are eligible for that in Nebraska. Um, all of our schools and school districts apply and are eligible as well. And if there happen to be a consortia, groups of libraries and school districts, they could do it as a uh, group application. Uh, we have an EA website on the Library Commission a web page and library commission website all about e-rate for public libraries nlc.nebraska.gov slash e-rate so you can go there for all sorts of um, details um, and i will just mention here since we are talking about we did mention schools here i handle as i said i'm the state e-rate coordinator for public libraries um, and the department of education has staff that handles this for the schools so um, you'll hear me talk more about libraries here and that's what you all are of course but schools do this as well and they do it with the help from the department of education so how much of a discount can you receive from um, the E-rate program? Um, anywhere from 20 to 90% is available. Here in Nebraska, most of our libraries fall into the 60, 70, 80% range. So for whatever you pay for your monthly internet costs, you could receive 60, 70, or 80% off on that and not have to pay that. Um, the discount is based on um, the percentage of students in the uh, who are eligible for the school lunch program. This is the free and reduced lunch program in your school district where your library is located. Um, this isn't the number of students that apply, it's the number that are eligible. Uh, they needed to find something that is an indicator of poverty and whoever, and so they picked this as that criteria and the if you have more students eligible for the free and school lunch program, that's an indicator that you have more people, you know, that your community needs more help and you get a higher discount. Um, also, whether you're urban or rural is um, calculated into that as well. Most of Nebraska being rural, of course, and getting a little higher. So what is E-rateable? What can you get a discount on? Uh, E-rate is broken up into two categories, category one and two. <laughs> and services, uh, category one is getting the internet to your library building. That's your monthly internet costs and any construction involved in getting that set up. That's where special construction comes in. And then category two is once you have that service to your building, how do you, how do you use it? There's physical equipment that you need to have, cabling, wiring, routers, et cetera, um, that you need to have inside the building. And that's where you, you category two um, covers that. And you see I've got a little, there's a graphic here. That brick there is your, you can think of it this way, that's your library wall. Category one is outside the library building. Category two is inside. Um, only things related to providing internet service are eligible for E-rate, not the devices that you use. So not computers or laptops or wireless printers or any of that. Those are not E-rate eligible, just the things related to getting the service to your building and making it work. So category one can be anything that gets you high speed internet. So wireless, Ethernet, DSL cable, so all of these things are available um, to get an E-rate discount on. So you don't have to be on fiber, but fiber is what we're, we're talking about getting to here today. But any of these are available um, for category one. Category two, as I said, is all that equipment, everything in your in your wire, your closet there for your network, um, access points, firewalls, switches, routers, et cetera, et cetera, power supply, anything that makes it work. Something to also be aware of is that in order to apply for and receive E-rate, you do need to be in compliance with SIPA. This is the Children's Internet Protection Act. Uh, this is where you have a, what their wording of technology protection measure. That means a filter on your computers, something that blocks certain types of um, materials that are harmful to minors. Um, so just getting to bad internet sites is the short version of that. Uh, so you do have to do be in compliance with SIPA. There's information on the USAC website and on our E-rate website um, with more information about that if you wanna uh, talk about uh, how to do that. But you do have to be SIPA compliant to receive E-rate and to receive this um, special construction funding that we're gonna be talking about. 
E-rate is an annual program that you do have to apply for every year, and there are multiple forms that you do at different times during the year, and I am the one that helps you get through all these forms. So this is to show you the different ones that happen right now in the fall is when we start with the 470, and then we go through the winter and into the spring, um, and even into the summer next year, possibly doing all of the other forms in the process. Uh, like I said, I'm not going to go into detail on this at all today. Um, we have full training um, coming in that E-Rate 101. I highly recommend you take a look at for a little more detail on this. Uh, in spite of this picture I have here of, of papers, E-Rate is all done online. <laughs> there is the E-Rate Productivity Center, acronym for that is EPIC, which was uh, instituted in 20, 2016, and you go there to do everything. You submit your forms, you answer questions, you upload contracts, um, do all of your back and forth with USAC for your E-Rate application, um, all online in an account you have there. So specifically talking about special construction. Uh, special construction is, as I said, under category one because it's about getting the internet to your building. And this is, um, special construction is, a um, you can get new fiber run to your building. So if you already have fiber, this isn't for you. This is just for libraries and schools who don't have it at all. Um, and you can get a discount, that same discount of that you, of the 60, 70, 80%, whatever you have on all the construction that is done, any program management, any planning, all of that. Now, I mentioned that the E-rate funding year starts on July 1st. We do, USAC does understand that you might, your construction and your company might not be able to wait until then to do the construction. And you really want your internet fiber to start on July 1st when the funding year does. So they do allow you to do the work and do this construction, digging the line, digging the, um, trenches and laying the cables and whatever up to January 1st of the year. So this construction would actually start possibly somewhere between January um, and July 1st. And then by July 1st, you've got your fiber good to go. So that's special construction. What the, um, that is, always, is available for E-Rate. There's this special deal now that um, USAC came up with also back about 2016, um, a state matching fund. If a state would come up with some funding to match the extra cost that a library would have to pay, E-rate will match what the state is putting up. So you have a cost for, engine, for a construction project um, the, that you get 80% of it covered by E-rate. So some of it still have, um, needs to be paid by the library. The state comes up with money that will help cover that and then uh, E-rate will give even more. Now, to put this in more, uh, make it easier to understand, here's just the math of it. Uh, and this is just an example. Uh, the emails from Holly had a much lower <laughs> um, bid because we- It's a little uh, more realistic, but, it, yeah, but it's possible. You know, yeah, if you're out yeah. there in the pan in or somewhere. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you never know. And this is a nice round of numbers too. <laughs> yeah, the bottom line. <laughs> yeah. So if you had, if, it took, if, if you get a, um, a company says it will cost $100,000 to run fiber to your library. Um, and you have an 80% E-rate discount. E-rate pays for 80,000 of that covered by that totally, leaving 20,000 that needs to be covered by the library. But if your state has a matching fund set up, they do 10% of what's left over, which is 10,000. And E-rate says, oh, hey, your state's offering to help. We'll help even more and we'll match whatever the state gives you. And in the end, with this particular math of a $100,000 project and an 80% E-rate discount, the library costs them nothing to have the construction done. Zero. Zero. This is if you're at an 80% discount. Now, if you have less than 80% discount, you will have to pay something. 80 is like the, the magic number. And if you have a higher than 80, you don't get money back. You don't get extra. It just all gets covered. And um, so great deal to get fiber run to your um, library and to your community, as we as we have mentioned. This gets that all that work done and covered by E-rate and, in our case, the state of Nebraska. We do have, through the Public Service Commission, they budgeted a million dollars to do this um, for libraries and schools, uh, starting 2021. And um, we've got some libraries that have done it already, and that's why we have Amber on with us. Uh, there's a link to go and look at all the information about it. So if you are not fiber connected, you can apply for E-rate. So first you apply for E-rate saying, I wanna do this project and you see if you find someone who will do it. And if you do find a provider that will do this, then after you've uh, got that set up, you apply to the Public Service Commission, a separate application to them to uh, get that match, get that extra money for what you owe, would owe as the library. Once you have that approved, 
then when you do your second form of the e-write process, when you tell USAC, hey, we've got this set up, we've got this company to do it, we've got the state matching funds, you submit all that to e-rate, and they say, great, we now will have you on our list of people that will get that match. Um, we will match what the state is giving you, and you will not have to pay anything, or you'll have to pay a small amount depending on your e-rate discount. So that is the quick version of e-rate and special construction. Anything I missed? <laughs> Holly, Sam, Becca? <laughs> I, I guess the one thing to say and, and the emphasize, and uh, that was great, but the all of this process, um, it's it's a process, and and you can not do anything with any and any step along the way if you choose not to. So uh, I I just want to be sure. Yeah, I should mention Are that you're still going through it. So I may. There have is that. it's a no. We've mentioned and we do mention this when we talk about it to libraries. It is a no obligation thing when you do this first form, the 470. A 470 is just saying we're looking for somebody to provide us with this service. We're looking for a company that can do this, and um, we'll see what's out there. So we highly recommend doing this at the very least, just to see, because you never know. We've had some libraries that say, oh, our, our, our service provider doesn't do fiber. You'd be surprised. They just might. Or, as Holly said, there should be a different company, and you might end up switching. So just put this out there. It does not commit you to anything. Just get this out there saying we're looking to have this done and see what kind of responses you get back. Then you could go to the second step and do the 471 and tell USAC, okay, we're, we want it, we want to do this. You still aren't committed. You can still, even if they say, yes, you get approved. If you decide, wait, the city's not ready for this, it's too much, you can just stop there too. You're not committed. This is all just, you know, feeling it out. And you will at least get an idea of what will it cost, what kind of companies are out there. And then maybe if this year it doesn't work out for you, do it next year. This uh, funding from the Public Service Commission is good through the, this is the third year. Sorry? I'm sorry. The only way that commits you is if you sign a contract. Right. So, so this might seem like a lot of effort to do before you sign a contract, but remember, um, you know, that it's a pretty incredible discount and you're working mm -hmm. with the federal government on top of that, but um, yes. really is um, something that um, it's, it's also very empowering. I have to say many libraries have told me this. They've gone through the process and did not move forward. But it really did. As Krista said, it gives you a good idea of what's out there right now. Mm -hmm. And you can hold on to that. And maybe in a couple of years, you decide you want to try again. And you may actually get a completely different result. But Oh, yeah. Oh, you probably will. Yeah. And I, I'm not to say that the technician that comes to help you, uh, perhaps your ISP technician that comes in, and you ask them, the library director says, well, how much would it cost to get fiber there? That they don't always know. And so that's the other thing is you you this is this is the definitive process to mm -hmm. understand. What, what's and as far as the contract, you do at this point the the second form do have to give USAC a contract. But we make sure. And I was actually chatting with Amber about this yesterday. There is a phrase. There is a um, clause that we make sure is added to any contract you do that states this contract is all, will only be followed through on if we receive. E rate funding. If we do not, everything is null and void. And putting that in your contract is legal and that covers you. So if you decide even at this point and you've done the contract, wait, well, something didn't work out, we can't do it, you've got that clause in there and you said, listen, we didn't get the E rate, we got just, you know, we got, we got denied for some reason or whatever. So don't panic if you're like, but this is $20,000 that we'd have to then pay. No, you won't. You've got that clause, you're covered, you're safe, you always have that um, out. Right. There's my contact info, the E-Rate page, if you have any questions about um, E-Rate. Anybody has any questions, go ahead and type in the question section, and we will answer them. I don't see any now, so I think we can go on to... I've got a quick question, Krista. Um, sure. So what's the, what's the deadline for submitting the 470 then? I mean, when does that need to be in? Is it, is it open now? For special The 470 is open right now. We do not know what the deadline, well, okay. As far as E-rate, we don't know the deadline yet because for the 471, there is a deadline for that, but it is announced each year and we don't know what that deadline is. We gotta know that deadline first from USAC, then we know what the E-rate deadline is. However, that's for E-rate. When we're talking about adding in, you wanna apply to the Public Service Commission, they have their own deadline of December 31st okay. to um, submit to that. So you would have to have um, your 470 done um, 
by the end of November because you do have to wait to do the 471. You have a it's a whole thing. Um, you but have to also you have to a bit of bidding. So um, I would say mid November if you want to be participating in this and getting this public service commission money at the very latest to do your 470. And yes, it is available. Well, one thing is the RFP, it has to be out there, you know, for 28, basically, I, I suggest 35 days, because if you start off with the R, uh, with the time when the ISPs can ask questions, it's possible your scope of work can change if they bring something up and then you may have to start again. So it, I, that's generally how I do it. I would say that you need to submit it on, on the, whatever day you submit it. It's nice comfortable to have 35 days but yeah. if you have to ultimately i think 28 days is you know, 28 is a minimum yeah. but yeah. having more time is always better the, yeah. the more time you have, the better it manages to change and you have to update all, uh the bid you know process yeah so anyway that's so i so if you're looking at your calendar we're looking at october 13th for our special construction we're going to be on the move but we're here to help you so know that it's possible to do amber can tell you you can do it in a pretty swift amount of time <laughs> that's one of the reasons that she's great to have on today to talk about her experience Okay, so when we're talking about what are our options um, when bidding for fiber, you know, we're talking about this uh, 470 submission. Basically, you have an RFP that goes out, and um, or you have another option. Do you want to highlight a little bit about Network Nebraska first? Before? Sure. And this is this is another option which the Library Com uh, Commission fully endorses. We are partners in this activity, so. Yep. So Network Nebraska was formed by state legislate, uh, legislative action back in 2006. Um, it's, its basic mission it was to provide a secure, scalable educational network that's uh, partnered with the, Unite, the, the University of Nebraska. So the OCIO's office and the University of Nebraska partnered to create this educational network. It's been around since about 2006. And every year it gets a little bit bigger. Um, that's really the basic background, very simplistic. If you have more questions, we can definitely. I just have one that I sure. think is interesting. Of course, you, you cover schools. Do you, schools. do you know the statistics on that? If not, it's or... almost completely. So we actually have, uh, I would say more than 99% of the public schools. There's only one school district that's not a part of Network Nebraska. Libraries, we have that option, but it's, you know, as educational, it's the, obviously the public and non-public school entities within the state of Nebraska, as well as colleges, private and public. And then additionally, we do, we do have the ability to also serve libraries or really any political subdivision within Nebraska. So that includes municipalities and counties, but where we don't have very many of those, obviously our focus is primarily schools, but that doesn't mean that we can't serve libraries as well. Right, and that's why when I visit with a public library about do you have fiber in your community, um, they always say, well, the school has it, I think. Mm -hmm. and, and that is true, but the, the company that manages that is primarily just focused on schools, getting fiber to schools. They aren't looking at, integrating into the community? I mean, not necessarily. I mean, we definitely can for specifically the municipal offices, but it's kind of goes hand in hand with that, uh, those, those anchor, those anchor facilities within communities. So you can get it in the door through the school, the library, if there's a municipal hospital, a county hospital, we can get that in the door that way. And then that opens the gate for other businesses within the community or the county to be served if it's if it makes logistical sense. So we're going to go through a set of slides. We can move forward, Krista, please. And and basically on the left side is um, the, this would be if, and you could do both. The good news, you can do both of these. And, and I would encourage you to do both of these. Um, you're going to find out it's a lot easier on that Network Nebraska side. You, you know, she's, she'll tell you how to do that. But 
but for the side where you are working through this, it's also something, you know, you want to get all the options available to you in front of you and in front of your library board and your community. So it's also very good to work through that, the ISP internet access with you as the initiator. And when we say you, we're a village, so don't worry about that. So, um, and just talking about this, um, so the 470 that Chris has been talking about and saying how you uh, complete that, this is, like she said, it's uh, the 470 is, form is completed by you. Uh, for special construction, category one, special construction. And that will include uh, submitting this RFP, which we will talk about in the workshop training. And when it talks about this must include these three aspects, they, if they are not in there, E-rate um, will, uh, I mean, uh, USAC will say no, uh, we, we, it's not a valid bid. They become pretty strong-minded about this. And so we, we need to make sure we emphasize this in my opinion, on our um, library submitted um, uh, 470s, we want to make sure that the RFP includes this. And let's see, evaluates. And so also the difference you'll see here is that when you are doing this, you put your group together to do evaluations of bids and set the schedule, et cetera. Um, we'll certainly help you with that, but that's one of the pieces that's in the RFP. And then with Network Nebraska, we partner with the State Purchasing Bureau and, and we draft the RFP document um, to bid on any of our RFPs. The service provider has had to already sign a master agreement that is already in place. So we draft that RFP document and then we include in the appendices the specific location. So really for us, all we need to know is your demographic location, where you are, who the, who the primary site co uh, contact would be. And then in addition to that, those breakdown of speeds that you might want, you know, we can go from one, 100 megabits per second to one gigabit per second and, and really up beyond that, if that's what you wish. We just need to know the breakdown. And then once that gets finalized, we will be the ones evaluating those RFP responses and we select the, we award the, the circuit or the contract to the lowest final offer. Now for us, we can even have that contract drafted and signed, but you are still under zero obligation to buy until you've communicated with the OCIO's office and specifically me, that this is what you want. You want a work order for this site location for this much bandwidth. And then we submit that. And at that point then, that's when we enter into that. That's when you would be under obligation to buy. But we can even, for us, we can even get to that signed contract phase. So the obligation of the library to do this is? Just to provide us the information. Right. That's so, all so we need library, to know. library would contact you and say, hey, we're looking mm -hmm. at this. Right. Can you do the Send 470? You, you would do the 470 for us. Here's where we're at. Yep. Here's the speed that we want. And then right. at that point, you take over. Yep. We just need to know that you're interested, where you're located, and the, and the speeds that you want. And we would include that on our already planned RFP coming up this fall. Mm -hmm. Okay. Let's move forward. So, uh, what we're talking about here is the non-recurring fiber build. So that would be the cost, uh, the normal E-rate discount plus 20%. That would be uh, what kind of costs would it incur. And, and we hope we're at 80% because then we don't have to pay anything, which is wonderful. <laughs> and then um, the one obligation, and I know that I'm finding this in some rural communities, is to apply for special construction. They, they um, you must apply for 100 megabits per second. But we also, just to mention on our RFPs, we also grade that, radiate that from 100 to 200 to 300, 400. And you might be surprised at the number of small rural libraries have, who've made a decision based on the cost that, you know, there's not much difference between 100 and 200. We're just gonna go for the moon, you know, so to speak, coming from 12 megabits. So that's the, the cost. So on the Network Nebraska side, it, it looks a little bit intimidating and maybe uh, um, like there's more. But what I want you to keep in mind is when you're paying, for the most part, when you are going through an internet provider and you're not con you're not 
connecting into Network Nebraska, a lot of times you were still paying those very similar fees, the monthly reoccurring costs, plus the interregional transport and the separate charge for internet. They just bundle it all together and they call it internet. So for us, we do itemize those out so that, um, and you'll hear about that why, or one of the big reasons why we do it. And so we have that monthly reoccurring cost that we will take the invoice or we will get the invoice from the internet or from the service provider. And then we will only bill back to you what your non E-rate portion, but we will take that and that's really the, the equipment that gets the internet in the door. I think Tom's always called it a water and pipe scenario. He's always said that's the pipe that gets, that gets, you know, installed into the building, but it really is the equipment that gets the high speed internet from fiber into your door. And then from there, we have the interregional transport fee, which is basically just a fee that helps to subsidize the, the backbone that goes along the university network. And then you would pay that separate charge for your internet access, depending on your bandwidth at that time. So those three fees, the monthly reoccurring, the Network Nebraska, and the separate charge for internet access, it looks like we're charging you a lot more, but a lot of times those are itemized. They're just bundled into your typical ISP costs. Now, what we do charge on top of that is that Network Nebraska participation fee. And we'll go into some of the benefits to being a part of Network Nebraska, I think on the next slide. But for now, that that helps to subsidize because this is basically a, it's a, it's, doesn't profit, it basically has to pay for itself. So those participation fees that all the school districts pay and the communities that are a member of Network Nebraska and the university system, they all pay into this program to, to continue the success of it going forward. And that pays for upgrades and other, other services that we offer. Okay. Uh, I just want to mention here too, and and because I mean, it doesn't really indicate that on here, that the monthly recurring costs. You know, if you've gotten this installed, the um, fiber installed using E-rate, you will can you will also be applying for E-rate for those monthly costs. So you will not be paying the full amount of the monthly cost. You'll be paying only what's above your discount rate. So for the construction, construction and doing the fiber special construction, getting that to your building in the first place, we you um, get that for the example, like our math, the 80% discount, and then you get the extra money from the Public Service Commission, then E-rate. Um, but for your monthly cost, you just still get that 80% discount for your month. So, you, so don't think, oh, we're gonna pay the full amount of what that costs now every month for 100 megabits or 200. You'll yeah. get your E-rate discount on that monthly cost too throughout the whole funding year and on to into the future, as long as we keep helping you apply for E-rate. And that's that's how the network of Nebraska those parts not, not the participation fee but the the the, the monthly month. recurring costs and yeah. that interregional transport fee and the internet those are all those are all separate separated out but those are all also E rate eligible. Right. So all of that you get that whatever your percentage discount does. So remember that. And then the actual um, the with Network Nebraska, I believe it's four-year contract for 48 months yeah uh, oh, yeah okay. support and then we typically include uh with the option to extend for four one-year renewals so potentially out to eight years right but the basic is 48 and for the rfps um that are submitted for, by the library okay. usually well what's included in them is the one two and three year option, which the, they can submit for their bidding process. And, and they can be dramatically different because obviously the longer you are um, associated with the ISP, they can recover their costs. Mm -hmm. And so that's one thing I want, we don't mention these slides, I think we probably should. Have. Okay. Okay, so we're on pros and cons. Mm -hmm. I'll let you go first. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> well, let's talk about the pros of Network Nebraska. Um, so like Holly had stated, we have the potential and we can do a lot of your E-rate filing for you. We would do the 471, the 470 to start, the 471, and then we only charge you the non-E-rate portion back and we take care of the 470. For us, we do a 472 bear reimbursement and we take care of that in-house. Um, 
the one of I think the biggest selling selling points of Network Nebraska, especially for libraries who you know you are the likelihood that you're going to have on-site technicians to maybe help you if there is an outage is very low, or even you might not even know that you have an outage until you get to the library that morning and you try to turn on your computer and it's not connecting. We, because we partner with the university system, we do have a team of engineers that work with Network Nebraska and they monitor the traffic 24 seven. So a lot of times if you have an outage in the middle of the night, those, those network engineers are going to be notified and they're going to be already working to provide a solution to you before you even know that it's happening. So we coordinate with the service providers um, on your behalf by doing that. I know Tom's kind of gotten to this before and it, it gets a little, a little, complicated and so in the previous slide we talked about how internet service like internet service providers typically bundle the cost of their backbone uh, internet and the, the actual equipment to get the internet into your door but because we separate those out we have the ability to give you e-rate like charge you e-rate back or basically file for e-rate on those backbone and those transport costs the equipment to get it into the door so you even if you are not SIPA compliant we can we can file e-rate on those we just can't do it on the internet section because that's where it's you have to be SIPA compliant to get the internet portion so that is kind of a benefit you can still get some of the backbone because there it's not a requirement for those aspects of it so that's another pro that's associated with this we also do have we work with ESU 17 or 16 I'm sorry and we have an enterprise ownership of Zoom licenses. So that would be, as a Network Nebraska member, you would have access to be able to purchase those Zoom professional licenses at a pretty large discount. One of the other things, because one of the participants talked about, you know, she doesn't get a lot of complaints about the internet, but she does, she wants to find more programming and get better internet speeds. Because this is an educational network, we are a member of Internet2. Now, for schools, that provides a benefit through peering services for testing, things like that. But one of the unwritten benefits, or one of the kind of the, what would be the word that I'm trying to think of, hidden benefits that not a lot of people maybe know about in the state of Nebraska, is that there are cur curriculum resources that libraries, the schools have access to, but the libraries would all also have access to. So, you know, if you're interested in that information, I can get that from the internet to resources that I have, but that would be something that you have available. Additionally, part of those participation fees, I know cybersecurity is becoming a, a buzzword around even people who are not maybe so, like they don't have the higher speed internets, they're not a big school or a big library with 10 gigs coming in the door, but I think cybersecurity is becoming a buzzword word in the community regardless. So we have certain equipment that's attached to our network that can help offset some of those cyber threats. Um, primarily what we have is called DDoS protection, which is the denial of, a distributed denial of service. So that's when you have some attackers that might try to attack your network and they just have, it's called a botnet. I won't get too technical, I don't wanna lose you, but they'll try to attack your network and bring it down. So we have equipment installed into our backbone and as a part of our network that helps to filter that off and get rid of it so your internet stays safe. Um, I, the, really the biggest con for us, I think, or the biggest concern that some libraries have is because of that participation fee, the, hop, the cost can be a little bit higher. What we do try to do is provide the services to offset it and, and make it make sense maybe a little bit more for you. Okay, so uh, if the, this is a local library, uh, you make a decision that you're going to go with a bid um, yourself as opposed to with Network Nebraska. Um, again, you know, nothing's free. <laughs> I'll just use old adages of words, but, but basically this is, uh, it will be more than likely, it is a, a lower, co a lower uh, cost for you. Um, and, and then also, um, this is a pro and I think also a con. <laughs> it can be, uh, depending on what type of service provider, technician, or, you know, what kind of response that you're going to be getting. But um, again, that's one of the things in my mind, I think about with libraries, you know, how many libraries you call in the morning. Well, I really can't talk to you right now because our internet is down and I don't know what's going on. 
Um, and this is something, especially now and after COVID, we had so much Wi-Fi distribution out there, you know, in the middle, you know, somebody comes in to do their homework from 15 miles out and they park and they don't have, there's no internet. Um, so this, I'm not saying that it would not happen the Network Nebraska at some point, but, but I think they'd be much more proactive at that. So that to me is um, uh, something to be thinking about. And also E-rate filing. Um, I think and my opinion is that E-rate filing, although I've never filed for E-rate, I think it's a lot easier when it's online now. And I think that many people are, are able to work their way through that. But um, so so when there is some kind of a conversation, I just need to ask you if if the library gets something back from uh, no, it wouldn't be a part of your situation. Do you get you also then deal with all those uh, emails that come back to uh, the library from USAC saying there's a problem with this or that? Yep. So here is a, a happy smiling face <laughs> who manages that her, herself yes. or with a team or with as a team. A, or or whereas those of you who are E-rate users know that sometimes that can be frustrating and you have Krista to help you and that's for sure, but um, sometimes they can come at the most inopportune times. So I was just thinking about that because I've seen a lot of those recently that come to me. I don't do anything with them, Krista does it all, but uh, just to be sure that there is that kind of communication that you would have to be dealing with, it's a con. Uh, service disruptions are mitigated locally. This is what, um, that's why she went first because she covered it so well as far as what it is that needs to be done and what is included in your network Nebraska fee. And then you will have to um, abide by the SIPA rules in order to uh, have E-rate it, um, usage of funding for your um, costs. So that's also a definite con <laughs> for many libraries. Okay. Can me to go in? Yeah, you can go in. Okay. So we've kind of covered some of the information on this slide. Basically what we need to know um, right now, me, I am working with the educational state E-rate coordinator and we are working to draft that RFP and get that to our state purchasing bureau before October 2nd or October 1st, which is the date that we have on this slide. Um, so if you want to be a part of the special construction RFP that we have coming up, you just need to reach out to me. My contact information will be at a later slide and you just again need to know, you need to let me know where the library is located, the, the site contact and maybe those increments of bandwidth. And if you need some help figuring that out, we can definitely walk you through that and talk about what's most common. The contract term, as Holly asked earlier, is for 48 months with the potential for buying or for um, renewing for four one year increments. Otherwise, also at the end of that four years, we could then just put you onto what would be our general RFP and we could just continue that service that time. Again, like I said, there is no obligation to buy. If we if we add you to the RFP, just get the information, as both Holly and Krista have talked about, just to find out what's available to you. You are under no obligation to either join Network Nebraska, it's completely volunte voluntary, nor are you under any obligation to purchase work, a work order off of that state contract. And we will contract with the providers directly on your behalf. So that's when it comes to making sure your build out's done on time, that's, that's a service that we also offer. Okay, on the other side, we've already talked about that we um, asked for bandwidth increments um, from the, the library to make the decision. They have the RFP. I see the dates didn't get changed on, on my side of the <laughs> column. Um, sorry about that. But I'm going to estimate about the end of October, very beginning of November, we should be uh, turning in our 470s mm -hmm. uh, right now. And, um, and the signing and the boarding of the contract will be actually, uh, the award for the contract would be uh, sometime toward the end of mid to end December, I think, you know, mm -hmm. I will say, and I, I don't want to be held to this, but the uh, Public Service Commission has been very flexible with deadlining for our uh, matching fund from the Public Service Commission. They've been wonderful. So I, I suspect that's because we don't have a high number 
of uh, applicants or for the grant but um, I yeah I wasn't sure if I was wanted to mention that but since you did yeah I, on my slides it did say the deadline is December 31st to apply for that Public Service Commission money and that's why it says it on that website but I think almost every year we've just reached out and said, oh, we have a library who wants to do it and it's like January something or February, is that okay? And they're like, yeah, yeah, send it to us. Right, and exactly. Okay. They want, the money is there just sitting waiting to be sent out. So they wanna do whatever they can to make it so they can get it out to you all, so. So we move on and the next slide, I'm just gonna bypass. Um, this is. We'll go into depth into this in our next training. This is basically outlining the year uh, E-rate year uh, and the difference between um, Nebraska um, Network Nebraska and your local uh, submission for um, social construction. So we'll move on. Okay, Amber, finally. <laughs> Thank you so much for waiting and being a part of it. I love this picture. I had a, a hard time uh, getting, well, she, she just couldn't find a picture. And then she had this one and I, uh, that she submitted. And I love it. Um, must be from the Innovation Studios, Amber. Yeah, I was actually out there when that picture was taken. I was, I had just used the, um, uh, the router, the CNC router. Yeah. Uh -huh. And the staff member that came with me, she was like, let me take your picture for the web. I feel like a dork. <laughs> Again, thank you for taking part in this and uh, feel free to start, you know, if you want to introduce yourself again or, you know, please. Uh, so my name is Amber Sweetland and I'm the, the director for the Kimball Public Library. Uh, Kimball is about 20 miles from Wyoming and 20 miles from Colorado, just so you have an idea of where we are, um, kind of in the middle of nowhere. Um, so our community is pretty small. Uh, we're about 2,400 people and I've been here, um, I've been at the library for five years, but I've been the director for two. Um, I actually first attended one of these sessions in 2020, right after I took over as director. Um, and, you know, once I kind of learned everything and all of the steps, um, my enthusiasm wanted to just go forward and do everything the right away. But then I realized that that was nuts for me. <laughs> so um, that first year, I just decided to get um, E-rate and being SIPA compliant and all of that under my belt. Um, and then, you know, the following year, I wanted to move forward with the fiber. I know one of the biggest pushes for this is, you know, connectivity issues. Um, we didn't really have any other than the occasional, you know, slow, occasional complaint. But I mean, it was pretty rare. But the way I looked at it was this was something that eventually was going to need to happen regardless, because that's just the way the technology is moving forward. And why not do it when I can do it for free or next to nothing? Um, so I did. Um, I lost my place. Oh, so for Kimball, um, our discount rate is actually 80%. So while our total bid was $25,000 for the construction, I paid nothing, uh, which was pretty fantastic. Um, our average speeds before we got our fiber installed was about 12 megabytes. Um, and our contract speed now is a gig. Um, we're not actually getting that, but there's reasons. <laughs> um, so our actual download speed at this moment through our Wi-Fi is only about 30, uh, which, you know, obviously it should be faster than that. But I've found that there's a lot more involved than I originally anticipated. Um, but when we're direct connected, we're getting about 250 megabytes per second, which is, is really good. Um, and our tech people told me that it's, a uh, portion of it is because of our super compliant device. It slows it down to an extent, um, but it's still a thousand times better than it was before. So, and then the Wi-Fi issue, we're actually in the process of hopefully applying for category two and redoing our entire Wi-Fi system to speed up our Wi-Fi. Um, yeah, where was it? Anyways, uh, so the application process was, was awesome. Um, it was fast because I uh, got confused on some dates, but everybody over there, Holly and Krista were amazing and they helped me through the whole thing. They actually made it pretty simple. And uh, I mean, there was a lot of stress involved for me just not knowing what I was doing, but they were always available. Anytime I had a question or a concern, they answered the questions and quelled my fears and you guys are awesome. Uh, <laughs> so, 
our service provider that uh, did the work and we're actually using the internet service for is Nebraska Link, which I think they've changed their name since then. Okay. Um, but yes, exactly. Uh, but I couldn't be happier with them. They, one of the biggest problems that I've found with my E-rate is uh, when I first did it, I didn't, well, when I first filed for E-rate that very first year, um, I told USAC that I would do the billing myself, like we would pay up front and get reimbursed. Mm -hmm. I've come to realize that was dumb uh, because, <laughs> because filing bear yeah. forms is a nightmare. Mm -hmm. um, and so Nebraska Link, they actually uh, do the billing for me. So when I get my bill every month, it is $35 and done. I don't have to do anything else. So I love them. Um, plus they're just amazing with their customer service and uh, we had a couple of issues right at the beginning. They were here super fast to fix everything and they're just, they're fantastic. Um, I think the only other thing that kind of was uh, our ugly was COVID. <laughs> so we had uh, gone through all this process and we actually were live July 1st. Um, I got COVID for the first time in June and also one of my staff members because she had picked me up from the airport. Uh, so two of us were home in the middle of summer reading. Um, at that point, I had not yet gotten my approval. While I was homesick during the second week, Nebraska Link showed up to put in our fiber. Um, and my staff was amazing and they did not want to bother me. And they knew I had been working so hard on this. So they didn't tell me that they were here putting in fiber because they thought it was okay. So I came back and freaked out because I didn't have $25,000 to pay them. Um, and we hadn't gotten approval yet, but thankfully, because of that caveat that we put in the contract, uh, I wouldn't have had to pay if we hadn't gotten approved. Um, it was about three weeks before we actually got the approval, um, but we did. And so everything was fine. Um, it all worked out great. Um, I say there's absolutely not a single regret. Um, you know, our, our community as a whole, they are just absolutely thrilled that this has been done. Uh, there was one business that kind of was in the process of getting it into town when I was as well. Um, so, and they were a little bit faster than I was. So, but it was nowhere near us. It was completely the other side of town. It's all mm. two miles away. Um, so they had to bring it all the way from the train tracks to the library, um, which they did with boring. Um, but it was simple, it was easy, and I'm very happy. It, do fiber. Right. Any questions? Uh, I mean, just brief. We'll, we'll have questions and answers after, but if any of the libraries are on board, would like to just directly ask her a question if they've listened to her. Um, yeah, if anybody has any questions, go ahead and type them in, or if you have the microphone, you can unmute. Um, I will mention it is a little after 11, which is when... Yeah, I, know. We need to, I, I would rather... Um, uh, oh, maybe we can uh, wait with uh, Amber and then just go through the less, next couple slides and then do a Q&A. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, if you have any questions, think of them, type them in. No, yeah, go ahead. One thing I do want to mention um, is Amber's experience with um, uh, optic uh, networks. They did the same thing with Baird Public Library and I think they just might like to see library directors panic. <laughs> <laughs> well, I have that clause, and I said, "Yeah, don't worry, don't worry." But they, either that or they're clairvoyant. I don't know, but uh, I thought that was interesting. So they also gave me my contract, like when when I was in my 28 day waiting period, um, mm -hmm. I got no bids until the very last day. They walked it into me, so <laughs> there was also a little bit of a freak out there. Um, it was like four in the afternoon, and the guy and the sales rep walks in. And he's like, "Here." Cool. Very last wow. day. <laughs> That's wonderful. Okay, so we're just on 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 the next slide here. I if we can just put it up and then start questions because for the most part, I think it's all um, uh, uh, self-explanatory. This um this tool that, that's out there, and I can't remember what it's called, the broadband toolkit. Um, it's interesting if any of you are feeling like you don't really understand a lot of the terminology or what's going on internally in the infrastructure of your library or related to, there's a little bit in there now about E-rate um, and some other activities. This is a great resource to download, to use. Uh, we have the 13th and it's from 1.30 to 3 is our next um, 
meeting together for workshop, and this will be all focused on special construction um, only. Um, we will have one more, and I think what Amber alluded to and didn't really say um, outright is part of the issue is when you get high fiber, a lot of Nebraska libraries have old network equipment or some subpar, and they need to um, upgrade it. And so before you panic and say, oh my gosh, I can't afford to do something like that, remember that the category two, there is, the, and we've seen the list, and most of it is that type of equipment you mm -hmm. can apply for. And what we want to do is, instead of finding out about this afterwards and having you wait, we want to see if we can't get this um, we'll have, we will have a workshop in uh, November and you will be able to then apply for category two too. And that can arrive a little bit early and be installed. And we'll talk about that all later. So, uh, but just so you know that. Uh, and then a reminder about the training in the fall and our staff, again, we are uh, so excited about th this project and being able to bring you fiber. You just need to call us. No, no dumb question. And we see that you can send an email or contact Becca and she'll be happy to help you too. I, I encourage all libraries to go ahead and apply for Network Nebraska also. That's just my experience for the last four or five years. And then the, the thing you, you don't have to pick. You can do yeah, start right. both and yeah. then decide which one ends up being the better deal for you. Right. Um, it does sound like, oh, we're doing twice as much work, but you know, Holly and I help you do the uh, the one on your own. Becca, the the state does theirs, and then you see what kind of responses you get back, and then decide, okay, now which way do we want to go? When it all, you know, we see what everything is available and how much it's really going to cost, and when it's all going to happen and everything. Right. And then your regional system directors are, can be very helpful also. So you want to be sure to contact them, and if, and if they can't answer it, they'll they'll send it on to us, and and we'll get back to you. So, Amber, you wanted to say something. Oh. Yeah, just about the, the Wi-Fi system, you know, um, our mayor and, and a whole bunch of people in our community were so excited that we had this in place that um, when I realized our Wi-Fi system needed to be redone um, and I asked for that additional funding in my budget um, and then at the city council meeting, I explained why I needed it and to really, you know, make the best of the fiber, they were ecstatic to give me the money. Oh, okay. Yeah. Right. I mean, Even if I don't get the cash flow, I still am really, going to get it done. They were that they, that you know you were a little embarrassed by being like, look at this wonderful Amber, what she did. <laughs> oh yeah, at the employee appreciation dinner, the mayor made a point to make me stand up and uh, receive applause for getting fiber into our library, which is horribly embarrassing. So now the next step Amber, to, to be queen of uh, Kimball is to talk to them about the bead grant <laughs> being yes. prepared and have them and find out and have them work on that because then you will have fiber to the residents. The I just got to say one more thing. This is my concern is if this happens, is the library really viable anymore for, you know, uh, usage in the community books? Yes. But if you have fast internet at home and you don't have it at the library, what are you going to be doing? You know, you'll be doing your research, et cetera, doing that at home. I'm not trying to be a Debbie Downer, but this is one of the reasons I really think it's important that libraries get on this bandwagon now and get their fiber so it's at least uh, as uh, high a speed as maybe the residential will have. Mm -hmm. Okay, questions, are there any? Yeah, let's see. Um, nothing's come in. Sarah, Stephanie, Terry, do you have any questions? Anything you want to ask of uh, Sam, Holly, Becca, myself, or um, Amber about what she went through? Go ahead and type in, or if you can unmute, you can ask your question that way. Um, what else do we have here? And I will bump over here while waiting. There is all of our contact info, too. I'll wait and see if anybody's typing something. Or if you don't have any questions, you can just say, no questions now. I'll call someone later. <laughs> As we said, this has been recorded, so we will have the recording up and we'll email that out to you. Um, probably should be ready tomorrow sometime. If you need to revisit anything. And then I don't, um, Holly, are we going to provide them with the slides as well? I don't have an objection to it, but maybe I'll edit and put the right dates in the one slide. <laughs> 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 <laughs>
Yeah, make sure it's got that updated before we send that out to anybody. Yes, that's a good idea. <laughs> uh, Sarah says, I don't have any questions at the time, but I'm sure I will later. Thank you for all your the time and all the information. Um, I guess it, yeah, but I guess nobody has any questions at the moment. We covered it so well. Alrighty. Th this is Stephanie, y'all, and this has been so much information, so awesome. Need some time to process, and and just like the other commenter, I will have questions in the future, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Attending. Awesome. All right. Thank you, everybody, for being here with us um, today. Thank you, Krista. Yeah, and um, hopefully we'll all get new fiber to our libraries. <laughs> all right, bye-bye. Bye. Bye-bye.